Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this session on COVID and cancer. My name is Deepak Kuntia, and I am the Chief Medical Officer for Varian, which is the uh, cancer arm of Siemens Health and Ears. We have a great panel that we've assembled for you, um, and I'd like to do a quick introduction of our panelists today. Our, our first is Dr. Bert Peterson, and he is the Director of Breast Surgery at St. Barnabas Hospital here in the Bronx. Um, he really does have too many accolades to go over. It would certainly take the entire session if we, if we went over everything, but just a few things. Uh, he has been named uh, one of the best doctors of New York in the, for the New York Hall of Fame. He's one of the top surgeons in the country and has been recognized as such through the National Research Council. He has quite a passion for taking healthcare directly to the people, and he has been involved and has founded multiple organizations not just locally, but also internationally to help bridge the disparities, uh, the disparities gap everywhere. Our second panelist is Dr. Yakira David. She is a, uh, a gastroenterology fellow at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, she is actually going on to do an advanced endoscopy uh, fellowship very shortly. Um, she did her uh, medical training previously from the University of West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago. And she also has a passion for eliminating disparities in healthcare, has led multiple projects in this space, specifically related to gastrointestinal uh, tumors. She does plan on heading back to Trinidad and Tobago to continue her work that she's been doing here in the States um, to help uh, advance education and also the disparities in gastrointestinal tumors. And uh, uh, last but not least is Dr. Katya Dudelson. And she is an assistant professor of radiology at Weill Cornell Medical Center um, in the Division of Women's Imaging. She is also the associate program director for the Diagnostic Radiology Residency Program and Breast Imaging Fellowship Training Program. And in addition to her, her passion for education, um, she also is working on ways of optimizing breast cancer surveillance techniques for high-risk populations. And so with that intro, I'd like to go ahead and get started. And, and Katya, why don't we start with you? Um, you know, we've been seeing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, changes in the way that our patients would be coming into clinic for screening. And, and you, know, you know, we did see a, quite a precipitous drop in mammograms that were done during the pandemic. Is it safe to get mammograms now? Can you... Uh, can you shed some light on some of the controversies that have arisen as a result of COVID-19? Oh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and for that question, Dr. Kunita. Um, the short and unequivocal answer is yes, it is absolutely safe and more than safe, it is vital uh, for women to come in for their screening mammogram. So um, a, um, a annual yearly screening mammogram is important, very important for women's uh, health. Breast cancer is incredibly common globally and is actually unfortunately on the rise. In the US alone, one in eight um, US women will be diagnosed with breast cancer over their lifetime. And most of these women don't have a family history or genetic predisposition. Basically, the biggest risk of getting breast cancer is just by virtue of being a woman. But the number one way to prevent deaths from breast cancer is to get an annual or yearly screening mammogram so that uh, doctors, the radiologists, can actually catch a cancer when it's small before it spreads throughout the body so that it can be easily treated, which is, by the way, most of the time, just a quick relatively quick outpatient procedure, and a, mo a woman can move on and live um, her normal, happy, healthy life. Um, and so it is absolutely safe uh, and, as I mentioned, vital to do so. And uh, both uh, in the tri-state area and certainly across the country, practices have, um, since the pandemic, institute um, incredible safety measures uh, to decrease any um, risk of um, the viral spread uh, during these vital procedures. So it is um, great strides have been made and uh, the um, 
safety of a screening mammogram of coming in and of not contracting the virus is definitely there. As far as your sort of second part of the question uh, is, it is there's been a lot in the media certainly about um, COVID-19 vaccine and whether one can get a mammogram um, if they recently had a COVID-19 vaccine. And the reason for that is that we have found um, that by, after uh, the vaccination, COVID-19 vaccine, some patients develop um, swollen lymph nodes, little glands in um, the axilla or the armpit on the same side. This is actually a very normal phenomenon. It's an expected phenomenon and it's a benign phenomenon. It's something that you actually want to see. It's your body doing what it's supposed to do, which is reacting to the vaccine to create little immune cells so that should you ever be exposed to the virus, it they would be recognized and it would be fought off by these immune cells. The, the swelling is temporary and as I mentioned, benign. And by the way, actually happens with other vaccines uh, like the shingles vaccine, for example, uh, sometimes the flu vaccine and so on. The reason that comes into play with um, screening mammography is that when we take a mammo do a mammogram, take a picture, an x-ray of the breast, we can also sometimes see the armpit. And if we see swollen lymph nodes, sometimes that can make um, the physician, the radiologist take a pause. Um, but if they will take an extra careful look uh, throughout the breast and make sure if there are no other signs of breast cancer and a few, and I do wanna emphasize, you should be empowered to share uh, that information with your physician, with the technologist, with the front uh, desk staff, whether you've had a recent vaccine and on which side, if that history is there, then sort of the, you potentially may be asked to come back in a couple of weeks just for a quick, short ultrasound of that armpit to make sure those lymph nodes are going back to, as expected, their normal size. Now, um, in order to potentially avoid needing to come back, there are some recommendations out there to potentially try to get your screening mammogram either before the vaccine or about four to six weeks afterwards. And if you have that flexibility and if the practice where you're scheduling your mammogram has a flexibility, fantastic, do that. And that will decrease the likelihood of needing to come back for a quick short ultrasound. But I know that we all live very busy lives um, and in particular, uh, you know, over the last year and a half and that might not be uh, feasible either for you. It's hard enough to get uh, one day or a few hours off to get that mammogram on the books. So uh, the most important thing, if you have it and if it's scheduled and it's the day that you can get it, regardless of where it is in relation to your COVID-19 vaccine, keep that appointment because the most important things for your health is to get both, is to get screened for breast cancer and to get your COVID-19 vaccine. Great, great advice, great advice. Um, you know, let me switch to you, Dr. David. Um, given colonoscopies are slightly more involved than mammograms, um, you know, should we do anything different in terms of, um, you know, uh, getting our screening colonoscopies? Are there different types of procedures instead of a colonoscopy we can use for, uh, for those that aren't willing to go into the, to the clinic? And I know there's been some recent changes to the guidelines as to when somebody should get a, a colonoscopy. Can you also maybe highlight some of, some of that new, new information? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Dr. Kuntia. And I'll start with the last question first about the new guidelines. So previously it was recommended that everyone starting at the age of 50, if you have like no family history or any other high risk um, features for colon cancer, that you start your screening at age 50. For persons who are of African descent, it was recommended as well that they should start screening at age 45 because patients of African descent do have an increased risk of developing colon cancer as well as dying from colon cancer. Now, in the past week, the US Protective Society Task Force has released new recommendations that everyone should be screened at age 45. And the reason for this is that we've been seeing a trend towards having more patients presenting at a younger age with colon cancer, at an age that we might not, that we would not have otherwise picked up with our current screening recommendations. So for this reason, it's recommended that everyone who has an average risk of colon cancer be screened starting at age 45. The reason I'm emphasizing age 40 is average risk is because if for any reason you have a first degree relative, meaning a parent, a sibling, or even a child, who has colon cancer before the age of 60, or you have two, two first degree relatives of any age who have colorectal cancer, you should start screening at age 40. 
or even or 10 years earlier than when that relative was diagnosed. So for instance, if you had a sister who was diagnosed at age 45, your first colonoscopy should be at age 35. And specifically with regards to COVID-19 and the safety for coming for your, your colorectal cancer screening, coming for colonoscopy is absolutely safe. We've instituted a lot of protocols in all of our endoscopy suites across not just New York City, but everywhere where we've actually been scheduling less patients. So there are less patients in the waiting areas, the prep areas, and in the recovery areas to allow for adequate social distancing. Additionally, at least at our institution and many other institutions, we get COVID testing on each patient within five days of their procedure so that we know that everyone who's coming in is free from COVID to decrease the risk of any inadvertent patient to patient transmission. And all of us as staff, we are always screened. Most of us have been vaccinated. And we're also screened daily for any signs and symptoms of COVID-19 and we wear extra personal protective equipment as well to reduce the risk of us transmitting any COVID if anybody happened to have it, as well as acquiring any infection from you as a patient. So all of those measures are in place to protect you as a patient from any, from contracting COVID by virtue of coming for your colonoscopy. So it's absolutely safe from a, colon, from a COVID-19 perspective to come and get your colorectal cancer screening. Now, um, as you mentioned, Dr. Kuntia, it is a pretty involved procedure. It does require some sedation, some preparation, and there are other options that you can use to get screened for colorectal cancer, for colorectal cancer particularly if you are of average risk. Um, what I'm about to say doesn't apply to patients who have a higher risk of colorectal cancer, either by virtue of your family history or other genetic disorders that predispose you to colorectal cancer. And one of the common ways that we screen for this, and it's even widely used in other countries as well, is through stool-based testing, which you can do at home. There are two main stool tests that you can use. One is called the FIT, and one is called the FIT DNA. What the FIT test does is that it looks for microscopic blood in your stool, which indicates that there might be some abnormality in your colon that can be shedding small amounts of blood. Usually it's either cancers or more advanced polyps, um, which can, which have a high risk of becoming a cancer over time. So the FIT test is a test that you do at home. You get a kit from your clinic, you do a stool sample and you take a swab of it and smear it onto the card. And that is sent back to the lab and that tests for any blood in the stool. A negative test is good for a year. So it's important that if you do a fit test today, you don't say, well, I'm good forever. It's something that has to be done annually in order for it to have its protective effect um, to prevent you from developing colorectal cancer. The other test oh, I must mention, however, is that if your fit test is positive, you need to go on to do a colonoscopy. Um, I think sometimes people think that if I do a fit test and it's positive, well, that's the end of the equation. But I must emphasize that if your fit test is positive, we still need to go ahead and do a, colon, a colonoscopy to look for the source of where that blood is coming from. The fit DNA test is a test that's commercially available. Your doctor can order it for you. And the company ships the kit to your house. You produce the stool sample, you put your smear on the, on the, car, on the, in, on the in the bottle, and then you ship it back to the company. And this test, for both blood in the stool, as well as microscopic DNA, which is suggestive of changes of cancer. Um, this test, again, if it's negative, this is actually good for three years. Um, but again, you have to be very diligent about ensuring that you get your screening every three years. Um, and again, if there's a positive test, um, a colonoscopy is required. Um, so those are the different options that are available. Um, and by all means, it's really important not to let COVID-19 delay your screening. If you're due either for your colonoscopy or it's time for your annual FIT or your three annually FIT DNA, it's really important that you adhere to those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David. And, you know, um, you know uh, for the audience, I do see a few questions coming in. Continue to keep adding them. Uh, we will be, um, you know, answering as many of them as we can um, in today's uh, 
uh, session. But before I get into some of the questions, um, I do have uh, one uh, directed at you, Dr. Peterson. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, especially in the New York area, a bit about uh, some of the disparities we're seeing in healthcare as far as COVID-19, um, you know, how it is impacting different parts of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the New York area. Um, and also, uh, you know, how has, uh, you know, perhaps delayed screening during COVID-19 impacted outcomes in cancer, whether it's breast cancer or others. Uh, we'd love to hear your perspective on this. Sure. So uh, thanks, Dr. Kuntia, and thank you for having me today. I, I think if you look at the issue of COVID in New York, we're really looking at the tale of two cities, yes? Manhattan versus the boroughs. And particularly once you start to break it down by zip code, you could actually see by zip code that the highest incidences of COVID-19, particularly when the pandemic started, had a lot to do with uh, where black and brown people live in New York. And more so, the pandemic also highlighted that those zip codes correlated very well with where the essential workers in New York live. OK, that also correlated with those zip codes also correlated with homes where you saw multi-generational families living in those homes as well. So now you've got black and brown people who have higher rates of chronic illnesses like high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, who are now essential workers. They either, you know, they're in the hospitals cleaning, cooking, or they're out in the community having to go to work and they're coming back to homes where they're multi-generations living in that home, it was the perfect storm to see an uptick far and above what you saw in other zip codes in these areas where the COVID-19 pandemic was particularly brutal for uh, our communities. So that's one of the things that we saw. And then that then correlated to the fact that a lot of the chronic illnesses that these communities have weren't being treated. I mean, our ER stayed open, our clinic stayed open, but I can tell you during the pandemic at its peak, we weren't seeing the diabetic comas like we normally do. We weren't seeing the heart attacks. We weren't seeing the typical things that come into the emergency room. People actually stayed away, you know, and this had a profound impact as we were coming out of this around August and September. You know, I can tell you in my own practice, Women who knew they had a problem in their breast waited months to do anything about it. And I had a significant number of advanced stage breast cancers that normally I, I wouldn't have that required chemotherapy before I could do surgery. You know, to Dr. Douglas's point, you know, when it comes to the treatment of cancer, you know, we say real estate is location, location, location. But in cancer, the top three things that save you from a diagnosis of cancer is early detection. Number two is early detection. And number three is early detection. You know, so it's really important that people actually come in, you get your screenings and that you get the care. And we didn't see that during the pandemic. And now here we are now dealing with the after effects of a community that normally leaves a lot of attention paid to their care. It wasn't happening and we were there to take care of them, but they were too afraid to come in. So I think the prior two speakers have already said it's safe. We've made lots of precautions to have people come in and you should do that. The first two questions I just wanna just quickly address, you know, when it comes to, you know, what puts you at increased risk besides the things that I said about like, you know, chronic illnesses like asthma, heart disease, hypertension, if you even those endocrine uh, therapies that you're asking about or prior diagnoses of cancer, if you're sick, if you're chronically ill with anything- oh, that Can I just pause you for a second, Dr. Okay. Peterson, because I, the audience may not see all the questions. Okay. So maybe, maybe we can, I'll just read it out. You're answering sure. it, but yeah. just so that everyone is clear of what you're answering it to. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions that had come in, it, it says is, are people who are on endocrine therapies, such as for breast and ovarian cancer, at more risk of getting COVID-19 or having more serious illnesses? And a related question, mm -hmm. um, does a history of cancer raise your risk or health complications of COVID-19? So 
maybe now I'll go ahead and, and continue. Yeah, what raises your risk of COVID-19 is just being exposed, right? <laughs> Actually being more exposed than you need to be. Um, but in addition to that, any illness or any treatment that's impacting your immune system puts you at greater risk for developing a disease. So if you have, if you're on treatment, if you've had a history of cancer or any chronic illness for that matter, you should be taking all of the precautions as have been outlined by the CDC, social distancing when it's appropriate, wearing a mask when it's appropriate, and getting the vaccine uh, according to the guidelines, depending on where you are in treatment or not. And that's what I would say you know, for those two questions. Great, thank you. And, and uh, Dr. David, there's another question that, that came up that's uh, I think clearly in your, your uh, wheelhouse and it was, is the at-home colon test as good as the colonoscopy or as good as a colonoscopy? Well, we have a mantra in the GI community that the best screening test is the one that gets done. So compared to not getting anything done, we are happy with either a stool-based test or a colonoscopy. Colonoscopies have the advantage of being able to detect almost all cancers. So it's close to 100% for cancer detection, whereas stool-based tests vary from about 79 to 92% detection of cancers. Colonoscopy has the additional advantage of detecting polyps, which are a little gross that start happening in the colon. And then over time, there is a risk of these polyps growing into a cancer. But with the colonoscopy, you have the added advantage of being able to detect those polyps early, removing them, and therefore preventing you from getting cancer. So that's the advantage, I would say, of doing a colonoscopy over a stool-based test. Um, so both in terms of accuracy, earlier detection, and then if your stool-based test is positive, you still have to go back to a colonoscopy. And also for the effects of the cancer protection from a stool-based test to be effective, you must adhere to the either one year for the FIT test or the three-year interval for the FIT DNA test for it to be as effective as, to be closely effective as a colonoscopy. Great, thank, thank you for that. And, you know, um, you know I'll ask a, a couple of questions to, to all of the panelists um, and feel free to, to chime in. Um, you know, if, uh, uh, you know, if you have somebody receiving chemotherapy or radiation, does that raise your risk of getting COVID-19 um, or having, uh, uh, you know, it says, or having a more serious course of illness uh, from COVID-19? I think we may have alluded to it a little bit already, um, but- Yeah, the short you know, answer is, the yeah. short answer is it may impact the course of the illness where it could be more severe because you're, you're likely to not be able to defend, defend, defend yourself against the virus. But again, your risk of getting COVID has <clears throat> so much to do with the amount of exposure that you have. So you really need to protect yourself during uh, going through treatment like that. You know, a, a common question that I get asked is, uh, you know, I was just diagnosed with cancer. Is it safe for me to get vaccinated? Um, does anyone uh, on the panel have an opinion on that? Well, I think the guidelines recommend that you actually get vaccinated once your treatment has been completed and not during the course of, like if you're undergoing chemotherapy, that mm -hmm. you get, you know, your vaccine after you've been, you know, received your treatment. Yeah, absolutely. And just to add to what Dr. Peterson mentioned, um, it is the reason um, that you know, the recommendation recommend pausing a little bit if you are actively getting chemotherapy so that your body actually has the opportunity to create those immune cells uh, mm -hmm. in response to the vaccine. But anybody with a history of rescue of cancer um, or after treatment, it is actually, these are the populations that are some of the first ones that were recommended for vaccinations because mm -hmm. Um, you are potentially at a higher risk and you want to protect yourselves. And this is one of the best ways that we know how to protect from COVID-19 in addition to masking and social distancing is definitely the actual vaccination. Great, thank, thank you both for that. And uh, we do have another audience uh, question that came in. Is there anything I can do to improve my general health and my immune system? <laughs> uh, that's uh, probably uh, a, a long answer, but... Uh, uh, anybody else? Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Dodelson, you, you seem to go up. The That's a fantastic question. Thank you. I mean, um, the answer is yes. Um, obviously, you, your um, 
it's your body and and yes you can you should be empowered to do so and basically the best way to improve your general health and your immune system is um is eat well a balanced diet as much as you can um, and get physical activity, whatever that may be. It doesn't need to be, you know, getting, um, starting spinning one hour a day or something, or, or, you know, racing around Central Park. It's just even simply putting on your tennis shoes and, and walking. Um, so physical activity, uh, eating a balanced diet, getting different colors on your plate, as many fruits and vegetables as you can, and getting enough sleep that actually has been shown to significantly impact your immune system. So getting the eight hours, which I know is a challenge for many of us, but as much as you can um, helps very much uh, improve and augment your immunity. And I would add that some of that physical activity and the things that uh, sleep, I was going to make sure that we, we did say that people get enough rest, but there are also different types of physical activity that are really good for that kind of combine a lot of these things like yoga, meditation, participating in prayer groups or anything that helps to center you and keep you, you know, calm during this very difficult time. Because I think one of the things that we've underestimated during this time is the predicted increase in post-traumatic stress disorder, which in and of itself will weaken your immune system. And I think people are underplaying the amount of stress that they've been through over the past year because we've been like, go, 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 go. But as we come out of this, I think particularly those families who lost loved ones that weren't there for them, <clears throat> didn't get to be with them. I think the delayed trauma from all of that is really going to impact people's health as well. And I think we need to pay attention to the mental health of the, the whole population coming out of the pandemic. Yeah. And Dr. David, did you have a comment? I saw you went off mute. Yeah, and to just, I, I want to like really echo what Dr. Peterson and Dr. Dodelson have, have already mentioned in terms of diet, exercise, and addressing your mental health, but also whatever chronic, <clears throat> chronic diseases you already have, it's important to not neglect them. If you have diabetes, now is the time to ensure that you have the tightest control of your glucose, because by virtue of having uncontrolled other chronic diseases, that puts you at a high risk as well. So don't neglect those others. Thank, thank you for, for adding that. Um, you know, I do want to make a quick announcement here. I know we only have about three minutes left. I, I hear that there were some technical difficulties for some of the audience to connect in. I just want you to know that this session is being recorded and it should be available for at least a month uh, for you to, to log in and view it re remotely. Um, you know, uh, given that we only have uh, uh, three minutes left, uh, maybe I can give each of the panelists uh, you know, a minute to just, um, you know, uh, you know, bring your take home message for the audience uh, based on COVID and cancer. And maybe, you know, I'll start uh, with Dr. Dodelson on any message you'd like to, to give to the audience. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, absolutely. You, uh, it is vital for you to take care of yourself. It is very challenging to do so right now. So many people are dependent on you. And I know that you are stressed and stretched in so many directions. As, as I know it's been said and time and time again, put your um, oxygen mask on first. You have to take care of yourself or you cannot actually help others that depend on you. Uh, parents, children, friends, it's family. Um, and so one of the most important things that you can do, as we talked about here at length about, you know, your health and taking care of yourself is early screening as Dr. Peterson and Dr. David mentioned. So come in for that screening mammogram. It is not just safe, it is vital and get that COVID-19 uh, vaccine because that's one of the other ways that you can protect yourself and your loved ones. Thanks. And Dr. David, how about you? Any, any take home messages for our audience? Again, echoing what Dr. Dodelson mentioned already about taking care of yourself, but just remember that, to, that there are new screening guidelines for colorectal cancer and you may be eligible at a younger age now. So anyone who's 45 years old, regardless of your ethnic background, is eligible for screening. And if you have a family member who's had colorectal cancer, you should be screened earlier. So it's important to discuss your family history with your, with your family, which is something that we often don't do in our community. But um, just be aware of when you are due for screening and your different options. There are always options um, and it's safe to come and get screened. 
Great. And then Dr. Peterson, I'll give you the, the last, uh, last word for the session. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I just want to go back to my first statement, which is the pandemic brought to light an issue that we've been dealing with in delivery of healthcare in the United States for some time, which is in those safety net hospitals, like where I work, we were faced with the burden of taking care of the people who were most at risk, and then also strapped with being able to deliver the vaccines to these hard to reach communities as well. And so the thing that I want the listening audience to, what I have to say to you is pay attention to what's happening and vote for people who are going to see to it that the monies are going to healthcare dollars to take care of our communities. Stay woke, <clears throat> stay woke, get out and vote and vote for people that are going to make sure that we have equal access for quality health care for all Americans. And that's my take home message. Oh, thank you so much. And I think, you know, thank you panelists, all three of you. This is a fantastic session. Uh, sorry, we couldn't get to all of the questions, but thanks audience for your, your participation. Hopefully you found this educational and helped to remove some of the fear around cancer and COVID. Uh, thanks everyone and have a, enjoy the rest of the conference today. <laughs>